It is my great pleasure to introduce the afternoon keynote. Admiral Mike Rogers assumed his present duties as Commander, U.S. Cyber Command, and Director of the National Security Agency and the Chief of the Central Security Service in March of 2014. His distinguished career includes serving as the Director for Intelligence for both the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the U.S. Pacific Command and the U.S. Fleet Cyber Command, U.S. 10th Fleet. Admiral Rogers' joint service, both afloat and ashore, has been extensive and includes leading crypto cryptologic direct support missions aboard U.S. submarines and surface units in the Arabian Gulf and the Mediterranean, commanding Naval Security Group activity Winter Harbor, Maine, and serving at the Naval Security Group Department, among many other distinguished roles. He is a graduate of the Naval War College, an MIT seminar fellow, a Harvard senior executive and national security alum, and holds a, master's of, a Master of Science in National Security Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage Admiral Mike Rogers. Can you hear me in the upper deck in the back? We're good, and can you hear me down below? All right, well boy, I gotta tell you, what a beautiful form. That's a beautiful place. Well, thank you for spending some time this afternoon. It is a beautiful day outside, and yet we all find ourselves stuck inside here. So I apologize for you to that. It's, boy, it's one of those days where you just think, man, what a great world. So what I was asked to talk about is, what are the roles of Cyber Command and NSA in cybersecurity? And then glad to answer any questions from any of you on any topic. So as you heard, Command, uh, Michael Rogers, Navy guy, been doing this for about 35 years as a commissioned officer, been the director um, of the National Security Agency and the Commander Cyber Command for about two years. Two different organizations who use two different sets of authorities to execute different but related missions, joined together by one commander, in this case me, but also bound in fact by the, uh, in common by the fact that we are both elements of the Department of Defense, both NSA as an intelligence organization, as well as Cyber Command as an operational entity. The other thing we have in common are both in the Department of Defense. Cyber Command has three missions, one of which is directly related to a specific aspect of cybersecurity. That one cybersecurity focused mission is if directed by the President of the United States or the Secretary of Defense, is to provide our capabilities to defend, help defend, in partnership with the Department of Homeland Security and others, to help defend critical infrastructure within the United States. The US federal government has designated 16 different segments within the private sector as having specific implications in terms of infrastructure, specific implications for our nation's security. Think about finance, think about power, think about aviation, think about transportation, think about natural gas, oil, water. There's 16 different segments. The DOD and its broader mission to help defend the nation believes that it needs to be prepared if directed or tasked to provide a segment of our capability to help defend that critical infrastructure in the private sector within the cyber arena. That is the cyber, the primary cybersecurity mission outside the Department of Defense for U.S. Cyber Command. And we would do that in partnership with others. We would provide our capability in support of Homeland Security, given its overall role as the leader of the U.S. government's response to the private sector in terms of cyber capability. One thing I misspoke about, and I apologize to you, the other cybersecurity mission that U.S. Cyber Command has, because my frame of reference, I was thinking outside the DOD, in fact, it is our number one uh, mission, uh, is the defense of DOD's networks. So uh, three missions for Cyber Command, two of which, apologize, two of which are cybersecurity focused. One focused within the DOD, the other focused outside the DOD. Um, we're generating a, a dedicated mission force, we call it the Cyber Mission Force, a dedicated team of professional men and women, trained, focused, organized, yeah and optimized, if you will, against those mission sets. The, the primary mission for the National Security Agency on the uh, cybersecurity side, NSA, two primary missions. We are a foreign intelligence organization. That is the mission set that generally tends to get the most exposure. It's the one that the nation knows NSA the best by. But the role that's related to cybersecurity really is our information assurance mission, where the National Security Agency has several 
mission sets within the broad information assurance or computer network defense umbrella. The first is we're responsible for developing the cryptographic standards for all classified systems used within the US government. Secondly, we're responsible for defending all national security systems within the federal government. There's actually by instruction, um, there's a document that outlines what systems within the US government have been designated as national security systems. And the, the Secretary of Defense, who in turn has delegated that to the director of the NSA, is overall responsibility for the defense of those systems. In addition, while we have always worked within the DOD to provide our information assurance or cybersecurity expertise, increasingly over the last several years, that expertise is now being called upon to be applied across the .gov arena. So NSA finds itself partnering, working with others to provide defensive cyber expertise um, when it comes to almost every significant penetration within the federal government, generally partnering with others, we're often called in to assist. And then the, uh, the third area, and again, a relatively recent phenomenon, increasingly NSA finds itself, again, partnering with others in the federal government to apply our capability when elements within the private sector either approach the government asking assistance or we make a, a determination that there's a national security aspect to the problem. So for example, Sony. If you had asked me as the director of NSA, was I gonna be spending time with a motion picture company working on cybersecurity two years ago, I'd have probably, you know, I, I don't think so. And yet when Sony approached the federal government and indicated that they were concerned that they had been penetrated um, and asked for assistance, DHS is the overall lead, turned to the FBI and NSA, and so we were part of the broader effort to assist Sony in identifying what happened, how did it happen, how do we make sure it didn't happen again for Sony's networks. So those give you a sense for the broad kind of mission sets associated with both organizations. So I find myself both responsible for defending networks we own, so to speak, as a military entity. I find myself being accountable for generating capacity, capability, insight, and knowledge, and applying that both outside the DOD and the .gov, and increasingly on very specific situations in the private sector. And in doing that, we face many of the same challenges that our, our corporate teammates do. How do you build a workforce that's capable of doing that? How do you create structures, processes that are agile? How do you adapt to a changing set of behaviors? Two years ago, three years ago, I probably wouldn't have said much to you about ransomware. And yet if you ask me today, what are some of the trends that, that, that I find ongoing? Uh, I find myself focusing a lot of time and attention now as we defend DOD's networks, for example, against the, the challenges associated with ransomware. It's an example I use with our workforce. This is an expanding mission set that is constantly changing, constantly evolving, and at its heart, to be successful, we must be capable of partnering with others. Because one of the conclusions I've come to, there is no single technology, there is no single organization, there is no single entity here that has all the answers. It is all about how do you bring a team, a broad set of capabilities together, how do you focus them on trying to defend networks. Another takeaway from my time doing this now is that you also have to spend a good deal of time asking yourself, what are you gonna do if despite your best efforts, you fail and your network is penetrated? It is increasingly I've come to the conclusion that it is not a question of the if, it is a question of the when. And so what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Because it's a very different strategy and a very different approach when you're dealing with a penetration as opposed to when you're putting your resources designed to stop the penetration from occurring in the first place. It takes a different thought process, different methodology, different skill set. Um, Sometimes in terms of the workforce and what you're trying to create in terms of what are the skills you think the workforce needs. So that gives you a, a, a sense for, you know, what's our role? What do I see as some of the challenges? Again, at its heart, this is all about building strong partnerships. We have to be mindful of our role. I have overall responsibility within the DOD for defending the dot mill, if you will. But when it goes outside the dot mill, hey, we support others in doing that. We are not the lead and we're there to support others, being part of a broader team. Um, and with that, what questions do you all have for me? Because I'd rather not just talk at you. There's much more value in the interaction. So. What would you say the next Sony picture? 
what would I say are the, is the next? Oh, to the next. That's, I'll repeat the question. So the question was, what would you say to the next Sony Pictures? So I thought the, the positive about Sony was, um, again, diff different scenario of that which I had really been thinking about. And as we, partnering with others, were called in to respond to this, I remember one of the first conversations we had with Sony was, so if this is going to work, we've got to be open kimono with each other. Because if you want me to truly understand what's happened, I need access to your network, and I need to bore through your data down to the digital forensics level. That's the only way we're going to be able to generate insight as to what happened. Uh, because I have to admit, I'm a military guy, so my knowledge and familiarity with that culture is not the same as if I had been a civilian and a part of the corporate world. Um, you know, one of my concerns was, what's your general counsel's approach to this going to be? It's very, if you're in the private sector, you've got very valid concerns about liability, you've got very valid concerns about protection. It's not unreasonable at all for them to say, well, you know, I really want to think through what are the implications of us opening ourselves. In this case, I thought they were great partners. They said, okay, we understand, we have no problems. Uh, we sat down and talked about what we were gonna do. We were very you know, open with them. Here's what we're gonna do, here's the process we're gonna use, here's the methodology we're gonna use. Um, so what I try to, as a result of that and other experiences, what I try to say to um, my corporate teammates, as it were, is much as I find in my own military experience, leadership is a key. Your corporate leadership must understand that this is an inherent part of their ability to execute their mission, whether that mission is generating a product, generating a service, whatever, that you cannot just leave this to your chief information officer, your CISO, that you really have to own this problem set from a leadership perspective. You can't just turn to your network people and say, hey, this is your problem, just make sure I don't have any issues. You can tell the organizations that do that versus the ones where the leadership sits down and says, okay, let's talk about what our priorities are. Let's talk about what are the key elements of information, the key data sets, the key processes, the key capabilities that I need as a company to execute the generation of that product or service. What's really important to me? You don't want your technical people making that decision. You want your operational people making that decision. And you as a leader want to help set an expectation both for your fellow subordinates and leaders within the organization, but quite frankly, also for the workforce. It's funny, just before I came here, I was out at the Naval Academy and spoke to much of the brigade out there today. And one of the things that I reminded them was, in the digital world in which we live in now, if we've given you access to a network, you are now both a potential source of gain for us, but quite frankly, you're also a potential source of vulnerability based on the choices you make as an operator. And the other comment I made to the brigade was, and guess what? We have given every single one of you access to a keyboard and a, net, and a network. We haven't given you all access to weapons. We haven't given you all access to cockpits, but we've given every one of you access to a keyboard. That's the nature of the world we're living in now. The network has become so foundational, DOD, corporate sector, private, and our private lives as citizens, the network has become so foundational to the execution of both mission tasks associated with whatever your line of work is, as well as your ability to execute your day-to-day -day mechanisms of life in an efficient and effective way. The network has become, become so foundational now, we are all potential points of vulnerability. And you can have the greatest network in the world in terms of structure, but if you have an uninformed, um, unmotivated workforce that just either doesn't understand or quite frankly doesn't care, then you are really sub-optimizing that significant investment you've made in terms of structure, networks, et cetera. Sir. Uh, yes, Admiral, Rob Lieber from AFP. There have been some reports in recent days saying that the United States has declared or stepped up a cyber war against the Islamic State. Can you comment on that, and is this a new strategy, and can you talk about any the effectiveness of this? So, in an unclassified public forum, am I gonna talk on the specifics of what the United States government is doing? <laughs> so. Aside from that, what a great question. <laughs> so this is what I, you know, we have publicly acknowledged that we are using cyber as another tool in our efforts against ISIL in Syria and Iraq. We have publicly acknowledged that. I'm not going to go into the specifics of what we're doing. I remind people, look, we're involved, and it's the same thing in the kinetic world. We involve, we are working against an adaptive 
agile opponent, and I'm not interested in giving them any advantage. Um, on the other hand, we do want them to be aware we are going to contest you in the kinetic battlefield. We're going to contest you in the information dynamic. We are committed to this fight against you. Um, and we want to negate all the advantage. We want to negate the capability that you have. And cyber is one tool of many that we will use to do that. Sir. Yes, Admiral, thank you. Uh, Randall Fort with Raytheon. You, you named uh, two instances uh, where two years before you said you would have been surprised dealing with Sony ransomware. Undoubtedly, there will be um, others, particularly as the Internet of Things grows from tens of millions to hundreds of millions to trillions um, of objects by some estimates in the next 15 or so years. You um, noted, a, have announced a reorganization um, of NSA to try to cope with this new future. So I just wonder if you could share with us, first of all, are, are you confident you're going to have the agility um, and the flexibility to meet this threat? And then, importantly, from the perspective of a lot of folks in the audience, how can the private sector help you achieve whatever objectives uh, that you've defined for this new vision of how the, how the NSA must operate? Jack, so a Thanks. couple questions there. I'll try to narrow it down to the key components. So what the question really refers to is an effort that we have talked about publicly. We call it NSA 21. It's premised on the idea that the world around us is changing, that as good as NSA is, both in its foreign intelligence and its information assurance mission, that the world around us is changing, and that if we don't change as well, my concern was, are we going to be effective to tomorrow as we are today? And my concern was, hey, look, the nation is counting on us to generate insights as to what is happening in the world around it, what should be of concern to our nation's security, the safety and well-being of our citizens, and those of our friends and allies. How do we continue to generate the same level of information assurance or computer network defense insight given these changes? The, the changes we talked about, hey, we see technology fundamentally changing. As we looked out and we used a 10-year window, I said, I want us to think about what 2025 looks like. As we looked out to 2025, we said technology is fundamentally changing um, for a variety of factors, and encryption tends to be getting a lot of attention at the moment, but I remind people, look, the rate of change is so much broader than that. It's encryption. It's, as you heard in the question, it's the Internet of Things. It's the increased interconnectivity that is being built into every facet of our lives. I mean, when I was a teenager, a long time ago, a automobile was a mechanical device that had only one... Um, connectivity, if you will, with the external world, and that was received only in the form of a radio. It used visual symbols in the, in the sense of brake lights, headlights, turn signals to communicate it with the world around it, so to speak. It was largely totally autonomous, all mechanical. You look at the automobiles that we're all driving today. Boy, you sure can't say that. The automobile is just a symptom, if you will, an example of something much broader. This is now, the automobile is now an interactive set of systems designed to not only move us from point A to point B, but in so doing, provide us an increased level of external connectivity, music, imagery, maps, technology, and it does so with a host of subsystems that are constantly talking to the world around it in a way that we as the, as the vehicle operator have little clue, little understanding, and little awareness. And that is a microcosm to me of the challenges associated, for example, as we looked at that period 10 years from now, that internet of things where I thought, wow, interconnectivity, the potential for vulnerability is gonna be growing exponentially. Doesn't mean it's all terrible, so I don't mean to imply that for one minute, but we said, hey, the world around us is changing technically. We said, hey, look, the, the US intelligence community has been um, in a budget decrease since 2012. I don't see that trend changing in the immediate near term. So don't build strategies for me that say, well, look, if you only gave us a thousand more people and a billion more dollars, we could really fix this problem. Guys, that probably isn't going to happen. That's not the way to, to figure out how we're going to meet these challenges of the future. Um, I think the public's level of awareness and expectation for what we do and how we do it, it's greater today than it was five years ago. I suspect it will even be greater five years from now. And I'm a big fan of, guys, let's deal with the world as it, as it is. Let's not put our head in the sand. We've got to acknowledge the world around us is changing, and we want to anticipate it, and we want to be able to deal, we want to be able to deal with it effectively because the nation's counting on us. 
workforce. I said, look, NSA is competing for the same workforce now that Silicon Valley is, that my fellow partners, you heard Jim Comey earlier today, he, he and I often uh, talk to each other about, hey, we're competing you know, for the same people. Now, I remind him, look, you care about people who can qualify in handguns and you want people who can knock in doors. I'm interested in a bunch of geeks, okay? I could care less if they could shoot and I could care less you know, if they can bust down a door. So that's some advantage for us. Um, so the workforce is changing and the challenges associated with recruiting a workforce. How do you train a workforce for a rate of change that just keeps accelerating? The model we used to use was you would join the organization, we would give you your initial training, and we gave you a lot of initial training. In some places, we would spend up to two years training an individual. After you joined us with advanced education, for example, we'd still spend up to two years with really focused, in-depth technical education as you join the NSA workforce. And then we would say, and now we're just gonna put you on the problem, and you're gonna work this problem set for 10, 20, 30 years, and experience combined with that initial training, that'll get you where you need to be. I don't think that's a good model for us for the future. The, the rate of change, the complexity associated, training, education, learning have to be a constant as we're building the future. We've got to think about them as a constant long-term challenge, not something episodically that you just do when you first join the workforce. You put all that together, it led us to believe we needed to take a look at what do we need to do to ensure we're optimized for that world. And so we developed a series of changes. We call them NSA 21. We're implementing them now. As a leader, I find that very invigorating. How do you lead a large organization that is undergoing significant change, and you got to do it without compromising on the day-to-day -day mission? We can't stop anything we're doing. We got to continue to generate those insights. We got to continue to apply our computer network defense, our information assurance knowledge. None of it's got to stop. So as a leader, I find that very invigorating. The last part of your question, and then sir, I'll get to you next. The last part of your question really was, so what can the private sector, in this case it was Raytheon, what can the, the private sector do in terms of support to NSA, in terms of a relationship? One of the components of NSA 21 is the idea that NSA has to increasingly partner with the private sector when it comes to the development and application of technology. Interestingly, NSA's model is kind of at one end of the intel community, and I would argue NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office, is kind of at the other. NRO, relatively small government footprint, numbers in several thousand, a little bit more than that, but uh, well below 10,000. And the NRO model is we go to the contractors, to the private sector, they design our satellites, they fabricate our satellites, they mate our satellites to the launch device, they physically launch our satellites, and they maintain them, if you will, in orbit. NSA was always at the other extreme. The NSA model traditionally was we hire the best mathematicians, the best computer scientists, the best electrical engineers, and we generally develop our core mission technology in-house. Almost everything that we use for our mission set, we have developed in-house with our own people, the design work, the fabrication work, that's not a model that I think is necessarily optimal for the future. I don't want to walk away from a very capable workforce. I didn't mean to imply that for one minute. But at its heart, NSA is an organization that uses technology against technically focused problem sets. And much of that technology is, comes from the outside world, not from us. So I'm interested, how do we create a greater set of partnerships? The last point I would make, and those partnerships need to run the gamut from large elements within the corporate structure to very small. We cannot optimize ourselves for just the large DOD contractor force, for example. It's got to be a spectrum, because if you look at some of those cutting edge technologies in our mission sets, it's not necessarily the largest corporate entities that are doing that work. It's some of those startups. It's some of those relatively young, relatively small companies. We got to create a relationship with that spectrum. And that's one of the sweet spots for us at NSA. sir. Sure. My name is Patrick Maldre. I'm from Estonia, a small but active uh, U.S. ally. Uh, I run a think tank here, in a research program, a cyber defense research program here in D.C. And uh, it's called SIPA, and we're starting to think a lot about cyber deterrence or deterring cyber threats. So um, a, several NATO allies, including the U.S. Uh, and Estonia, have written this idea of deterring cyber threats into their national cybersecurity strategies or DOD cyber strategy. Uh, your recent Hill testimony yielded a lot of the word deter on a control F search. Um, I'm wondering, 
I'm wondering um, what kind of measures uh, are you referring to in particular and uh, whether this concept of cyber deterrence is something that can ultimately be uh, adopted in the NATO context to deter not uh, every single cyber threat, but uh, one particular uh, nation state uh, threat that uh, both of our countries are concerned about. Thank you. <laughs> Well, first, thank you very much. You're a long way from home. Thank you for your willingness to spend some time here in the United States. Boy, Estonia is a beautiful place. I was just there about a year ago. In fact, I'll be there again in another six weeks or so. Um, so one of the points I try to make is a strategy that is predicated purely on just responding defensively to penetrations will both be incredibly resource intensive, from my perspective, cost a lot of money, take a lot of people, um, it will be focused on response as opposed to getting ahead of the problem set. Now, I'm the first to admit, we are all victims of the culture that created us. I'm a naval officer. So I have been shaped for good or bad by that military culture. That culture has always told me the desire is to get ahead of problem sets. Shape the actions of your opponent and help to drive them to select courses of action that generate better outcomes for you than they do for the adversary or the opponent. So th that's not far from my mind just based on my experiences. Man, I, I don't like just sitting here reacting. That is not an effective strategy to me. I believe we have to, over time, get to a place where we deter the behaviors of others, whether they be nation states, groups, or individuals. Now, lots of different models and theories out there about deterrence. Um, if you use the nuclear model, and that's not necessarily a, a, a straight um, translation, to the cyber world. I don't want to pretend that for one minute. But if you use that, a lot of people use that as a starting point. If you use the nuclear model, our experience has told us you generally deter in two ways. You either convince an opponent that despite their best efforts, they won't succeed. Ballistic missile defense in some ways is an embodiment of that principle. Hey, you might have the capability, but I'll still defeat it. Or what has really been at the heart of the nuclear enterprise um, and it really goes to mutually assured destruction, is the idea that, look, even if you were to succeed, the price you will pay would far outweigh any benefit that that course of action would give you. Would give you. Um, those two principles have been used to create a measure of stability within the nuclear arena. We have had nation states, not good, no significant non-state actors, nation states with nuclear capabilities now for over uh, 70 years, and yet we haven't seen them used again outside of testing. I'm not gonna, uh, North Korea, a little different scenario, but. Um, so there are some who argue, can you somehow create concepts of deterrence in the cyber arena? My gut tells me we, we probably can do it in the nation state area. The one, the one that concerns me that I'm still personally, for me, working my way through, how would you go about doing it? is the non-state actor. How do you deter a non-state actor from engaging in this behavior? Most nation states, most, not necessarily all, while they want to gain an advantage and they will work hard to attempt to attain advantage, in general, most have come to the conclusion that if the price of gaining the advantage is somehow blowing up the status quo or fundamentally destabilizing the mechanisms that have ensured stability in um, prosperity, that in general, those are bad choices. So there's always a bit of self-limit, if you will. My concern is, is that really true for the non-state actor? If you take a look at ISIL as an example, they have zero interest in the status quo. Their vision is the destruction of the status quo to create a very different model. Um, and so how do you deter them? The only thing I can put my head around so far is, Every entity, every individual has something ultimately they value, in my experience. And so potentially, can we translate that into something that might shape the choices that a non-state actor group individual might make? But, but clearly, we have a ways to go to work our way through this. Sir. Last question. Admiral Rogers, Russell Wald with uh, Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Um, I have a question in regards to Hask Chairman uh, Thornbury's um, call in the NDA for the splitting of uh, CyberCom from Stratcom. 
Uh, first, do you think that this is a um, legislative answer that uh, Cybercom is ready for? And the second question is, and it's a bit of a twist on your deterrence question that you just had, is um, are there any concerns about the strategic defense of uh, deterrence if there's a split between these two organizations? Um, to the latter question, you know, my initial thought is no. To the first question, again, a much bigger issue than U.S. Cyber Command. I'm the first to acknowledge that. Broad policy implications, strategic implications. Rogers is not the individual who's going to make this decision, nor should he. It's a much bigger issue than us. It has implications both within the Department of Defense and more broadly. And we have a process that will work, its w work through um, the process in terms of what outcome do we ultimately come to. Um, this subject came up in my last public testimony. I, I testified before both the Senate Armed Services Committee and the House Armed Services Committee within the last 60 days or so. I was act, asked by both organizations, what did I think? And I started off by saying, look, I acknowledge this will not be Roger's decision. This is a much bigger issue than Cyber Command. But if you're asking me, based on my experience at the operational level as the individual who's executing the mission on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis, yes, I believe it is the right thing in the long term. Um, and meanwhile, we'll work our way through this process. Others will ultimately make the decision. Meanwhile, I remind the men and women of U.S. Cyber Command, folks, we got a mission. That's what we get paid to do. That's what we got to focus on. We cannot waste our time worrying about, not that they're insignificant, but worry about the issues that are within our span of control and within our responsibility. And this is not an issue in our span of control or our direct responsibility. So let's focus on what we got to do to execute our mission and help keep the nation safe. With that, thank you all very, very much. Have a great afternoon.